Good afternoon and welcome to the session uh, optimizing AWS Lambdas for cost and performance. I'm Benji, Benjamin Thomas. I'm the co-founder of Sedai. Prior to Sedai, I was leading platform teams in PayPal. So in today's session, uh, we'll focus on AWS Lambda. This being an AWS community event, we'll focus on Lambda. So we will understand, we'll talk through how Lambdas are managed in production. Uh, how can we optimize Lambdas for performance and cost? And some thoughts again, how do you approach it and what are the solution options? We'll go through that. So what you see, uh, these are the compute abstractions given by Amazon for end users. <laughs> so on the extreme right, you have EC2, which is probably more flexible. You know, you can configure it to the way you want. Extreme left is Lambda, which is purely serverless. And the responsibilities for Amazon, AWS, and the customer changes in this. So to the extreme right, the customer is responsible to do a lot of tasks. You know, how do you do your horizontal scaling? How do you do your vertical scaling? Which kind of network you encapsulate them in? You know, how do you manage it? How do you patch it? A lot of stuff. And towards the left in Lambda, it's considered purely serverless. Your runtime is given, you deploy your code, it's supposed to work. But there are a few things. If you look here, there are a few production configurations that are still uh, responsibility of the customers. So we'll go through that. Even that affects how your code performs and how much cost is coming. Cost so now we'll uh, uh, deep, uh, double click on what are the configurations available for Lambda management in production. And these are the five kind of high level things that Amazon gives us. And if you look at Google, Google Functions, Azure Functions, this is kind of a common pattern uh, that you can see. And I'll, I'll focus on a few things here. Memory, which is kind of an abstraction of memory, CPU, and the network resources. Provision concurrency, which is um, kind of um, how many horizontal um, you know, replicas of your Lambda you want to run at a specific point of time. And you have the timeouts, and I'll talk about warm-ups also in a little bit. So now we'll go deep on the first one, memory settings, which is one of the key configuration items that we use when you have lambdas in production and how you optimize them. So the way Amazon and uh, other cloud providers, they have uh, configured serverless, lambda, Google functions, Azure functions, memory is kind of a loaded configuration. Um, so memory technically has memory, CPU, and network resources. When you, when you talk about, oh, I've increased memory from 128 um, MB to 10 GB, um, which means CP is also increasing. So Amazon gives you the min in Amazon is 128 MB, and you can go all the way to 10 GB. But when you go through that progression, your CPU also increases. So we'll talk through all of those uh, when we go through it. So before jumping into how to optimize, I wanted to talk through how changing memory impacts your CPU, your cost, and your performance. So if you look at this graph, uh, when you increase memory uh, linearly uh, from uh, zero is not available in Amazon, it starts at 128 MB, and it goes all the way to 10 GB. So when you increase memory linearly, at certain points, you can see you'll, you'll get CPU spikes. So if 128 MB memory is giving you 0.5, a few millicores, 256 is going to give you maybe one core. 512 is, will probably give you two cores, so it increases. Uh, uh, in, in steps when memory is going up linearly. So AWS adds fractional CPU at certain intervals, and it's linear with memory. Next, let's look at how changing memory impacts performance. So typically, you think of, you're, you're adding memory, it's not going to affect my performance a lot. Um, so let's look at a, a REST web service, right? Um, so let's say if you have a web service, it may make outbound network calls, it may process a lot of stuff, it may do some temporary storage. So you have a lot of fixed costs. So if you're making an outbound call to an external service, which takes two seconds or maybe 100 milliseconds, it's, it's very hard to change that. You can go change that outbound service. You can you know, change a few things in the network. But there is a CPU-dependent part. Um, so if you get more cores, 
you might process faster. So even if you're making a network call, there's HTTPS involved, you might do a lot of processing. So if you increase CPU, your performance can come down. So in AWS, when you increase memory, you get more CPU cycles. So if I increase memory from left to right, when the memory is at the least, my execution time may be at the max. But when I slowly imp increase memory, I might see improve in performance up to a certain point, and then it's flat. That means you have kind of exhausted your you know, CPU cores that are available. There's no point in going beyond that. So that is kind of you know, the, the optimized point that you're looking at, right? So we'll, we'll talk in detail about that. So to optimize execution duration when you increase memory, CPU is also a factor. What is the impact on cost? Um, so the way cloud providers are pricing serverless services is you pay for the, your usage. So if you run a service for 10 seconds uh, with 128 MB, you pretty much run for the GB, you know, you're charged for the megabytes you used for that time frame, right? So if you run a service for one second and if you only have 512 MB, you're probably paying less. So effectively, when you are at the least memory, and if you're, if you're taking a lot of time, your cost is up here. When you're at the least memory, and if you're taking kind of average time, your cost is somewhere here. But if you increase your memory a little bit, and if your time comes down, your cost also comes down. That's how um, cloud providers are uh, charging you uh, on how memory impacts cost. So memory. Uh, cost is dependent on memory as well, and they have a good relationship. So let me take an example. So what you see here, this, so this is a test Lambda function that I ran. So I ran uh, it against 30 million invocations, 1 million invocations per day. Um, at um, 258 MB, uh, the average response was 289 milliseconds. The cost was $42. But when I bumped up the memory to 512, the average response came down to 82 because it got more CPU cores. Um, and so the effective cost was uh, much lower. But then again, if I go further up, if I increase that up to 768, 1 GB, 2 GB, it's not going to affect my cost a lot because I've kind of you know, used most of my uh, CPU out there. So there is an optimized point where you know, it's not the least memory, it's not the most memory. Somewhere in between, you can get the best cost performance uh, balance. So that's what we'll talk about. So we, we, we talked about three things, right? Uh, when, when you increase memory, you're adding CPU, so you're effectively getting more CPU cycles. Um, and when you increase memory, your cost is actually not increasing. If you're coming down in duration, you'll save on money. So, so we'll, 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 in this session, we'll talk about how you can come to that optimal point. OK. So what is the optimal point for you, right? So that's the question. So uh, you may have a batch application. You probably don't want it to run very fast. You're OK you know, if it runs 60 seconds, as long as you're charged very little. But you may have a real-time application. You probably want it to run in milliseconds, right? So what is the right balance? So we'll talk through that. So typically, this is a typical function or a typical microservice that you write. Typically, we all start right in the middle. You know, we'll give it some uh, CPU memory. It's running in a reasonable good duration. You're fine with it. But when, it, when, you hit, when the cost hits you is when you think, oh, this is not good for me. So uh, let me see if I can make it better. So this is your kind of your typical scenario. Your duration is not the greatest. Your cost is also not the greatest. You're somewhere in the middle. So let's walk through a few options on how you want to optimize them. So best of both worlds. You might want the best of both worlds, right? You might want an optimized cost performance combination, which is kind of right here. But there is a problem here also. If you have a very strong SLO, let's say you want 99 percentile of your functions to perform right here, or, or right here, you still have a lot of you know, deviations there. So this is good generally if, you know, if you're OK with some performance deviations, if you're tracking your SLOs at median or 50 percentile, you might be OK here. But this is one kind of performance optimization you may want. So best of both worlds is one option. 
Another option for real-time use case, even if, I, if I'm paying a little bit more, I want the duration to be the best, right? So REST web services, web applications, you want your duration to be best. So that's another optimization challenge that you may have, right? A third option is, it's kind of the batch, backend, you know, notifications kind of use case. You're okay if the duration goes up a little bit, but you want the cost to be minimum. So these are the three buckets you have. Do you want a balanced one? Do you have a cost optimized one? Or do you have, want a performance optimized one? And typically, you know, if you're running microservices in production, you'll have a combination of all these things. So you may have 60% of your applications which has real-time SLOs. You may have a small percentage which are batch and notification and messaging systems. And you, you may have like kind of in the middle systems also where you want it to be best of both worlds. So, yeah, where do you want to be on the curve, right? So based on the type of application. So every application doesn't fit here, doesn't fit here, doesn't fit here. It fits in one of these. So one of the first activities that you would want to do when you optimize for performance and cost is to identify where do you want your application to be in. You know, you, do you want uh, a cost, a performance optimization, even if I pay more? Do you want a cost optimization? or kind of a balance. So that's one of the first activities that you want to do. So let's, that's the variable, right? So, um, so let's say you have a bunch of uh, microservices, and each of them will behave differently with seasonality, right? So you want to identify those variables. You know, uh, what are those variables? Does it change a lot, right? Um, and do, I, do I have frequent releases coming in? Are there dependencies that, that are affected? Things like that. So you, you look at that. And when I make a change, um, if it's a real-time application with five nines availability needs, you don't want to affect anything, right? So, so if I make a change in production, is that a safe change? And then when I change one thing, there's a dependent function or there's a, uh, there are dependencies that uh, it may be affecting. So you want to look at those complex dependencies. So there are a lot of variables involved uh, in optimizing your functions or microservices for cost and performance, even if you have identified all those balances. So those are some of your challenges for optimization. So you have identified what kind of optimization, what do you want to do? You have identified the challenges, okay, what are the variables around these microservices? Now, um, one of the, so I'll, I'll just go through the, um, this thing and say, so, when you look at these things, right, so you can do point optimization mostly, right? You can, you know, you can put 10 performance engineers for 100 microservices and say, I'm going to optimize all my microservices. It's done, but that's not the case, right? Uh, so you want it to be continuously optimized because you may combine microservices, you may split them, you may add business logic. Your functions and microservices are going to change. So you, you want to build a kind of a you know, um, a knowledge repo and intelligence in your, either within people or could be ML models, you know, whatever approach you may have. You want to build that intelligence uh, in your platform where you know that, you know, these applications change like this, this has a certain part seasonality, um, and apply those factors to all the functions that you have. And then you continuously monitor all your microservices and continuously optimize them each time they change. So that's kind of the high-level solution approach. Now with that, I'll jump to the solutions, right? So we talked about the problem, cost and performance balance, at what level do you want? What are the things that affect it, affects it, and what are the variables? So in Amazon, one of the immediate things that you could do is, you know, we'll, we'll walk through each of them one by one. Um, so just listing it out here. So you could pick the right architecture of the machine. Do you want an ARM processor or you want the traditional like side six? You could do manual analysis and optimization. When I say manual, you could look at eyes on dashboard, look at latency, look at traffic, uh, optimize it. You could write point automation on top of it. And then there are a couple of tools we'll talk about. Um, Lambda power tuning tool is an Amazon. It came out of Amazon. It's open source. And SEDA is a company I'm part of. We do this autonomously uh, without you know, anybody, uh, humans touching it. So we'll go through all four options. Uh, the first one. Uh, architecture is kind of a one-time one choice. Uh, Amazon now provides Graviton processors, which are ARM processors. Uh, they're technically 20% cost-effective, so if you look at the invocation cost for ARM is green, uh, invocation cost for uh, x86 is blue, so it's approximately 20%. Uh, 
Um, there is performance gain also. You can see that at um, you know lower memory volumes, the performance is significant. Eventually, it's pretty close. But that there's a cost benefit is definitely there. So that's kind of a no-brainer choice to go for uh, Graviton. A few things to think about there is you are changing your architecture, so you might want to recompile your code and test it against ARM processors. Um, typically, uh, if it's an interpreted code like Java, it should work just fine. But you know, there may be some binary dependency which, which is very specific to the architecture. So I'd recommend, even if you change from an x86 to ARM architecture, if you're using Graviton to still test your functions to make sure it's working, but you're going to get a 20% to 30% improvement immediately. So that's kind of a no-brainer now that AWS has uh, come out with Graviton. So that's definitely something I would recommend, but test it for sure. Test each and every function. Um, number two, the traditional ways, you know, you, you have CloudWatch, you may have Datadog, you may have an, other monitoring providers that you use. You watch your, um, you know, your latencies against traffic um, and error counts against your different seasonalities that you may have a Monday peak where you have maximum traffic. Um, you, you watch against it, then you play around with your numbers in your Lambda, each Lambda. So um, you adjust your Lambda memory up a little bit, see how this is changing, and then you kind of find the uh, optimized uh, configuration, stick to it, change it every time you release. So it's kind of manual, cumbersome, but you know, if, if you do not want to buy a product or try out open source, you could automate this. You could you know, write an API against CloudWatch, Datadog, or Prometheus. You could automate the process. Um, do you want to autonomously change it? It's up to you. It's up to the risk level. There are a lot of safety checks you need to do. So that's another way. I won't recommend the manual option, but uh, that's something you could do. If, if you have 10 serverless functions in your company or 10 microservices, you might as well do this. And if you're releasing only you know, once every two months, that's just fine. You can optimize it once, and it might not change at all. I, I wanted to talk briefly about provision concurrency. It is not really a cost performance optimization uh, use case, but uh, th th there are tiny bits of cost performance. So if you look at this graph, you see these spikes here. So in lambdas, there's something called as uh, cold starts. So if, if the lambda is not awake already, and if, if there's an inbound request coming up, and they spin up instances. So if you have very high traffic, and if you, have in, if you do not have enough uh, instances runtime running, you see those uh, cold starts in lambda. So provisional concurrency is something that will help you eliminate it. There's a cost that you pay for that, but it will help eliminate cold starts. With provision concurrency, you, you pay an upfront cost, but your per transaction cost comes down a little bit. So according to AWS, um, you get uh, a peak value at 60% of usage. That's when, you know, if your memory is used 60% or more, you see value in provision concurrency. So above that, you see definitely a cost saving. So that's something you could think about. Uh, again, to find out if your Lambda needs a provision concurrency of 10 or 52 or 500 or 2, depends on that specific Lambda, the seasonality that it will get, and how much uh, transaction can eat each Lambda take care of, stuff like that. So uh, you could play around with provision concurrency. Yeah, so for each Lambda, you will do provision. So in, the, in Kubernetes world, it's a replica set and your HPA VPA. So in Lambda, it's provisional concurrency. So Every time I write a new Lambda, I want to do provisional Yeah, based on the traffic you're expecting, you will adjust your provision concurrency on top of you know, putting a memory. So that's kind of your horizontal scale in the serverless world. Um, did I answer that? Okay, good. Uh, so that's something that you'll play around with. You're not going to get a lot of cost benefit unless you hit this 60% usage. But it's an availability, uh, plus if you have strong SLOs where you don't want to see these spikes, uh, you would want to use uh, provision concurrency, which is appropriate for you. Um, so that's another manual. Again, you could automate it if you want. That's 2A and 2B. I'll jump to 3, uh, which is an open source tool. Um, it's a very good tool. Uh, it came out of AWS. One of the AWS developer advocates made it. Um, so what you do is, I'll, I'll show screenshots of these steps. Um, so install, you would install, uh, this Lambda Power Tuning tool is available as a serverless application in AWS repo. So you'll install it from the repo. Per function, you will give a random set of memory attributes. So you'll, give, you'll tell 128, 256, 312, 400, 
test it with you know, 100, uh, traffic of 100 or 500. So you'll give those inputs, and it'll spit, spit out a JSON, and then you analyze the JSON, and you get the result. And it's manual. I mean, it, it's automated. The uh, Identifying the result is automated. But uh, you, know, you have to do it every time you have a release and for each function. Uh, and there's no support for provision concurrency. But we'll go through that. It's a very good tool. So if you go to um, the Amazon uh, repo um, and search for Lambda Power Tuning, uh, you can find it. Uh, you'll click on Deploy. It'll come up with the right permissions. Um, you'll deploy it. There are two. Uh, this is the input um, that you'll give. Uh, name of your Lambda, what do you want to watch, and you give it a set of values that you want to test against, right? It could be all the way to 10 GB. You could start at 128, you could give all the way to 10 GB. And you can give the tool how many invocations you want to test for each configuration. And usually it's a pre-production performance engineering kind of exercise. You cannot do it in production reliably because you know this number is not gathered. Anyway, once this is done, it spits out um, your best cost performance combination. They give you a small UI, uh, which tells you your best cost is at 512 MB, your worst cost is at uh, 3 GB, close to 3 GB, and it gives you a graph. And you want to be somewhere here if you want to optimize it. So that's the power tuning uh, UI. It's open source. You know, you could you know, install and use it. Talk about my company, Sedai. Uh, what we do is do this autonomously. So if Sedai is connected to, to an Amazon cloud, we identify all the serverless functions. We identify which bucket each application belongs to. Is it a real-time application? Is it a batch application? We, we do all those things with our ML uh, models. And what we do is, by default, uh, we identify which bucket you want to configure that, uh, optimize that Lambda for. Uh, and user gets an option to override it, but we identify that. And then, once it's done, our reinforcement learning kicks in, and then we optimize the lambdas for performance and cost. And I'll walk through the steps on how to connect. So online, if you go to sedai.io, you could create a free account. Once you sign up, you connect your Amazon account with the right role. This is not a real arm, so, and that's it. You're connected. Sedai can go in and optimize your lambda. So this is one sample optimization. Uh, it went from 87 milliseconds to 18 milliseconds with very minimal change in cost. So you, know, you get significant performance improvement uh, right there. So that's about Sedai. Um, and uh, effectively, to wrap up, right? So when you have too many uh, functions and microservices that change all the time, you would want to kind of follow this process. You want to identify how many microservices are showing up in your um, topology. You may add services. You may split them. You want to identify what kind of metrics. The metrics may be hidden in CloudWatch, Datadog. You know, you, we were in a talk with InfluxDB before. It, it may be coming out of Influx behavior. You want to identify the right behavior of the application. Now, is it a ap real-time application? Is it a batch? Is it a messaging application? You want to identify what kind of seasonality it has. You identify the candidates. You change it. Then you learn from what you change. And then you kind of uh, loop through it. So that's kind of how autonomous systems work. And, um, OK, so uh, kind of uh, closing out um, to optimize lambdas for performance and cost. Um, you have multiple options. You could do it manually. Um, you know, and there are architectural choices, your ARM versus x86 architectural choices. You could use open source tools. You could write automation on top of it. Or you could use a platform such as Sedai um, and the end user. Thank you. And I think that's a wrap. Any questions? Yeah. So by default, uh, we are free to a certain extent. Um, so up to 5 million transactions per month is free. So irrespective of whether you use it for 100, optimizing 100 lambdas or 10 lambdas, it's, it's free to that level. Then we charge based on the traffic volume. So um, that, that's kind of where we are. Yeah. Yeah, so we, we optimize EKS, ECS, and Lambdas. And we also optimize Kubernetes workloads across any cloud providers. So within AWS, we support ECS and Lambdas as well. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about optimization in terms of uh, this particular process that you're looking 
packages versus Docker images. So we did not, uh, so are you asking, do we recommend? Okay, you have a Docker image, so you're, you have the extra load of time of you know, loading up your Docker image, and then, so ideally you would want, you know, if you're using Lambda, right, you would want to be close to the machine as much as possible. You probably don't want layers in between, because AWS already gives you a compute abstract, firecracker, right? So you already have a Linux OS sitting at the bottom, then you, it's a, if it's a Java program, you have a Java runtime. So adding a layer of image will add another OS abstraction on top of it. So if you can avoid it, that's one less layer to deal with. But if you're migrating from a, an existing containerized workloads to Lambda, right, it's easy if you have a you know, Docker image already. You can migrate easily. Ideally, if you can be close to the machine, that's better. Any other questions? Yeah, so that's a common question, right? So ideally, um, you want to make sure. So, so if you look at um, you know systems around us, right? There are a lot of autonomous systems around us. We are already seeing driving, you know, autonomous driving cars. We have all sat in airplanes where you have a lot of, you know, um, you know, th there's a co-pilot which does a lot of autonomous functions, right? Um, so ideally, autonomous, when you write an autonomous system, you would want to make sure you don't mess up at all, right? Yeah, your effectiveness should be like close to 100%, right? So you want to make sure you do all safety checks. Um, you want to make sure um, you, you are taking the action that's required and it's making an improvement and not messing anything up. But to your question, even in that case, if it happens, or if you think that the system is going to make anything worse, you know, you have to alert somebody immediately and you know, let them take over it. But ideally, an autonomous system should not be, it should be safer than people operating it because autonomous system will check you know, safety checks, it'll make sure the action is right at the right moment. You, know, you, you probably don't want to act on the peak traffic, right? But humans can make a mistake of making a change when the peak traffic is going on. But an autonomous system knows, okay, I've identified these values, I don't want to make change in the peak traffic time. I want to make change at, in the middle of the night. Uh, or if in Kubernetes case, there are five replicas, you know, five pods running. Uh, I don't want to take out one pod. Uh, I'm going to add a few pods, then make the changes, and then kind of rebalance everything. So autonomous systems are smart to do all those things, right? Which typically, if humans do that, you know, they have to ask 10 people approvals, all those things. Any other questions? No. Thank you.